Welcome to the Home Service Expert, where each week, Tommy chats with world-class entrepreneurs and experts in various fields like marketing, sales, hiring, and leadership to find out what's really behind their success in business. Now, your host, the Home Service Millionaire, Tommy Mello. Hey, my name is Tommy Mello. I'm here with my buddy, Sean McGraw, and we're here to talk about For Energy. He's getting to be a large business. He's won the Inc. 5000 two years in a row, and uh, he's just moved into this new office about two months ago. Two months ago, yeah. Two months, and uh, he does energy audits. He sells everything from air conditioning to solar to duct seals, attic seals. Um, we do window films, replacement windows, basically anything and everything that relates to somebody's electric bill and, and the cost associated with the house. So, we got introduced a couple years ago, maybe a little bit more, and I was just fascinated when I walked in Sean's office because he does outbound, and I've never done outbound. He's been able to go find business. I've always let it come to me by spending a fortune on inbound marketing. So this is going to be really cool if you're wondering how to grow that side of your business because how much of your business, at least in the last few years, depended on you going and finding it? Yeah, so it's it's got to be it's got to be eighty percent of our business. We go out and we find. I so love we, that. we actually struggle with what you're good at, which is making the phone ring and bringing it in and paid for advertising and those kind of things. Uh, but what we're really good at is going out and finding it, especially when we need to. So. Tell us a little bit about, so I know your dad, we're both from Michigan, uh, actually, Sean's wife and my really younger cousin, probably seven years younger, went to high school together. It's just a small world. Super small world. Yeah. And one of the things that I really think Sean does the best that I want to talk a lot about too later in this conversation is networking. He's introduced me, I mean, we went to Chicago together, we've gone on a lot of trips, just, just a master networker, but... Tell me a little bit about, you know, starting in the window, kind of learning about that and then going and doing your own thing with Tyler and everything. Yeah, totally. So um, I'm from Detroit, very close to where Tommy's from, and I grew up in a family business. So my dad owned a window replacement company in Metro Detroit. And for those of you that know what window replacement is and that kind of kind of industry, it's it's old school. And that's kind of been my upbringing. So you know, growing up, I started in a warehouse pushing a broom and, and kind of helped my dad where I needed to help. And until I was 19, I was continuing to kind of learn different aspects of that business. And unfortunately, in 2007, we closed the business. I was a freshman at ASU. And a lot of people, when I'm doing these type of interviews, ask me, like, what was your aha moment where you wanted to go into business? And mine was more of a, oh, crap, what am I going to do with my life, right? So I got to experience a lot of hard work out of my father, growing a very successful business. It was a Renewal by Anderson franchise at the time. And, you know, he got to a place back then without social media and internet, you know, he was doing 15 to 20 million a year in replacement windows in a market that was a depressed market. It's Detroit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, moved out here to go to Arizona State and started the business before I, I finished school. So that's a little rundown of my history. You know, and I've been associated in the past with different partners, and I think it's it's very difficult to have a partner. For some reason, it is and it's not. It's kind of like a wife, and, and if you see eye to eye on certain things, it's easy and it's better, especially if you complement each other's kind of deficit, right? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, because I know that, I know that you got a great relationship with Tyler. Totally. And I know... You know, I don't really go into so much detail, but I know that you didn't have a great relationship with possibly some other people. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, I agree and disagree with what you just said. So I think if two partners agree on everything, there's not a purpose for one of the partners, right? So a, I, I, Tyler Nay um, bought into the company in 2015, basically January 1, and we don't agree on everything. Uh, he's kind of a, a wild dude, like like pushing the limits constantly. I'm a little bit more conservative and you know, it plays really, really well. We play off of each other's strengths and it is an amazing relationship. In fact, the growth of our company and achieving things like Inc. 5000 
it happened when Tyler came on board and, and really pushed me outside my comfort zone and, and started to move the needle. So in our relationship, it's great. Partners aren't for everybody, but we make it work really, really well. Yeah, I mean, what do you say to someone out there that's really struggling in a partnership? Uh, do you say you fold? Do you say you buy them out? Do you say you go to your own thing? Do you say you just work through it? Or I guess it's different depending, but... Situa- situational for sure. Um, if you've got a partner that, that things are really, really not working, I would, I would make a change. I would make a change whether that's buying them out, um, going and doing something else. It, it really depends on the situation, but a bad partnership typically means your business probably won't grow. It, it's, it's worth making a change. You, you know, it's tough to go into work when you can't stand who you're going into work to. And tough. I'm sure you've had employees that you're like, damn it, I got to go. A partner could be 10 times worse because they've got a say in what happens. But right. I mean, even a bad employee could just make it really difficult to want to go in. Oh, yeah. Toxic people are toxic people. And, you know, if, if your relationship with your partner or an employee is toxic, I would personally make a change as soon as possible. Rip the Band-Aid. And so often it's difficult to rip that Band-Aid. I've been in the situation where like, what are we going to do? And every single time I could say if I would have done it sooner, there would have been very little repercussions because for some reason we act. We Once that Band-Aid's peeled off, we're putting a sperm on it and we're sewing her back up and we're fixing it and it's 10 times better. Yeah. You're making it work, right? Yeah. So that's what ripping the Band-Aid is. It's tough, but when it's ripped, it's amazing. People always survive. So and they say, I wish I would have done that sooner because I feel a relief. Uh huh. And I feel so much better about the business and so excited again about coming in. So what was it like when you were, you know, pre-2015 when Tyler came on? Or, you know, to tell me a little bit about the evolution in your mind, the way you look at the business now. Yeah, so um, I'll do this briefly because a lot has happened in the last nine years since we, since we were founded. So I founded the company when I was still a student at ASU. And a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Well, it was, it was cool, but if you look at our sales from 2010, 11, 12, and 13, you wouldn't think it's amazing. It's, um, you know, part of me wishes I went and got some experience with somebody else that have, has, had already figured it all out, you know? So before Tyler came on board, it was a lot of trial and error. It was a lot of learning lessons the super hard way. And so I don't trade those years for anything, but you know, a lot of those lessons, we don't, we don't learn again. We fixed them and Tyler came on board. And since then it's been constant progress, constant growth, constant improvement. That's what it's been. I love that constant improvement. It's, it's almost, a big word that's been flaring up to me every day is consistency. Yeah. It's consistent growth, consistency. It's a lot of people feel like they get they get in this they get in this thing where they go um they go all in and they work out 8 hours a day instead of just 30 minutes every day for a year. And right. they get into this impact like if I do this so hard and uh it's the biggest mistake because they got to change their habits, you know, they just got to get motivated. Totally. And habits are the hardest thing to create, right? But they, when you create consistent habits, you create a consistent result. That's what you do. And that's typically growing. It, you know, and this has never been a better time to grow. I mean, it's amazing. Consumer spending's up, consumer confidence is up, unemployment's down, yeah. stock market's up. I, I, I don't know if this is artificial or if just I'm good at business or if everybody's just kicking butt, but I mean, this is great. Yeah, I totally. mean, this whole business right now, everything, everybody I talk to is like, and, you know, I don't think it's a bubble because I don't think it's going to crash like it did in 2008, Correct. 7, 8. I do think there's 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 going to be small recessions, which is inevitable, yep. but hopefully we never hit it like we did. But, you know, hope for the best plan for the worst type thing, right? Absolutely. You're right. I mean, being in business during those years, you can tell a total difference in what the consumer's doing. They're spending money on their homes. Like, I'm sure for you, and you are great at business, so that's a part of the equation, ah, right? But. People are spending money. They're investing in their houses, like unlike they've done in the last, you know, 15, 20 years. And we absolutely see it when we're in somebody's home. It, it absolutely is a good market and making a big difference in business. And the ROI is there. I think that's the biggest difference is people were losing their house in 2007, 8, 9, 10. Now they're making money on their house. There's an ROI. So that's a huge deal. This is what we'd call the belly. Isn't that right, Dominic and Avery? This is the belly. 
So I'll walk you through Belly kind of what everybody does in here. So we've got um, we've got Serena who typically sits here and she's doing solar design. So I like to say she's playing God. She's placing panels on people's roofs. And if they move forward with solar, you could look at Google Earth a year later and that's where their panels are. Uh, we've got Dominic who oversees our community outreach department. We've got Avery who oversees home shows and events. Give us a little wave. We've got, um, it's, it's late in the day, so not everybody's here, but we've got confirmations over here. So when we schedule appointments, we wanna make sure that, that all homeowners are present, right? We wanna educate everybody in the home and deliver information so they can make an educated decision on whether or not they wanna you know, do solar. Oh, real quick while you're asking that, tell me a little bit how you make sure that you get the homeowners, because you want Obviously, if it's if it's a, a married couple, yep. whether that's um, male, female, or male and a female, yeah, how does that look? Whatever the situation is, you know, every household has their decision has, maker. Has man. their decision maker, the people that are going to make decisions on that home. So for us, it, you know, we if, if we can't educate everybody, they're not going to see the value in what we're offering, and they're going to say no, right? So if it's a, a a husband and the wife's not there, or a wife and the husband's not there, or whatever the situation is. That person's not gonna move forward with efficiency or solar, they're just not. When they're both there and we can deliver all of the value, there's a good chance that, that they're gonna say yes to us because it's, and what, it's what a great thing. what does that look like on the phone call? So how do you make sure yeah. you say, listen, is Mr. Smith, is Ms. Smith? Tell me how you kind of prerequisite that into happening. Yeah, so we do a first visit, it's the energy audit. Only one homeowner needs to be home for that. But at that appointment, we're collecting names and numbers of of everybody that's the decision maker in the house. So when we make the call to do the follow up and go over their energy report, we say something along the lines of, hey, Mrs. Jones, um, when's a good time for you and Mr. Jones to sit down and go over this energy report, right? And the beauty of it is if our auditor did a good enough job on the audit, they're usually really, really excited to have that other party be present at that appointment so we can deliver the information of both of them. So 99% um, of the time, we get we get both decision makers. There are people that are like, oh, I make all the decisions. I don't need them here, and we still run those appointments out of respect for them. But you know, we do try to put them in a position to make an educated decision on saying yes or no to our products and services. I try. I usually ask them, "Do you bring your wife with you when you go grocery shopping?" No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, well, <laughs> those kind of th it's true, right? So over here, we've got our VP of Sales, Dan Mullaney. He's not currently in the office, but he's an absolute rock star. We've got bookkeeping and accounting who they're not in the office currently, so. Wave to the camera, boys. We've got our techs right here. These are guys going in the field and actually making the corrections in people's houses. So these guys are, are the face of the company, right? If somebody has a good experience or a bad experience, it's because of these guys. Where's your four energy shirt? In the front. Come on. Oh my gosh, we've got a truck in here. Okay, so this is our, what I like to call our glorified four car garage. Um, unlike A1 garage doors and, and other companies, we don't need a huge, huge warehouse to, to operate. We operate pretty lean. We park our trucks in back. Um, we've got duct work. We've got mastic for doing duct seals. We've got foam for attic seals. Most of our product is housed here. So in the last couple of years, you know, since I've known you, I've noticed just a complete I don't know. You're in this new building. It's it's more organized. You seem like you've got more of a, a strategic plan. What do you think's taking place? I know you've had some. You've had consulting, and I get a lot of consulting. We get consultants from everywhere. We read a lot. But what do you think's been some of those aha key moments over the last two years? Yeah, to, to kind of yeah, two to four, whatever. Yeah, just really. What was the incubator or the uh, inherent thing that's taken place, or what is the other word? There's um. um the catalyst moment. Yeah. Okay. Totally. So, uh, there's there's been a lot. Um, the biggest one, I think, this is something that most entrepreneurs would experience sometime in their in their career. It's having to address the same issues over and over and over again, and having to answer the same questions from employees over and over and over. And so, actually, part of this is is you know some people I meet, like meeting you and hearing some of the stuff that you're up to and the consultants you've used. But it's, it's being organized. I mean, that's, and we're not perfect at that. Like, in fact, I think we're terrible at that right now. And that's why we're consciously trying to, you know, build operating manuals and, and playbooks for every position across the company. We're trying to have 
amazing training and a, a standardized onboarding process. All of these kind of things that you that you standardize and and make uniform create a more uniform result, right? So instead of a lot of chaos on the front end, we're trying to we're trying to have awesome process and procedures. So on the back end, we know that that result's gonna probably be really, really good. So that's what we've really, really been up to. And currently today, if you ask me, you know, what is gonna take us to the next level, it's it's that. That's what we've been working on. That's what we're continuing to try to perfect. And the ultimate goal is to create this machine that we can, you know, insert talent into and, and leads and, and products and those kind of things and have a really good result on the other end. And have people be really successful in our organization. You're you're like three. That you're you're talking my language right now because I was at church this weekend and it was a guest speaker and he wasn't very good. So I took a lot of notes yeah. on my own stuff in my head and I hate to say that, but I put a hundred million, you know, goal for next year, but not not in a fiscal year. And then I said, how many techs do I need at four hundred thousand per tech, which is kind of a median number. So I said two hundred fifty techs. That means adding over 130 techs. Uh -huh. So I said, how much would we need month by month? And I figured out that number and I said, what do we need to do? I came up with 26 items to really streamline that. But I said, what happens if a truck doesn't show up from Enterprise on time? What happens if the tools come don't come from Amazon on time? What happens if iPads are low? So contingency plans, step one, step two, step three, if this doesn't happen. So where possibly could the bottlenecks be? So who picks them up from the airport? Where are they staying? How are we organizing all these things? Who are they going to get fed by? What are they doing that night? Who's going to be their trainers? Where's their manuals for this stuff? What's the standard operating procedures? Where's the checklist? And so we're creating to work backwards from our goals and actually design those and say, what's every single thing? So what you start with, instead of starting with 30, 40, 50 texts coming in in a month, start with three and say, okay, what happened here? The next time you fixed it, start to go to five. Yeah. Then you go to seven, then you go to 10, then you get to 20. And as you're repairing these things and fixing them and building contingency plans, you know, one of the stats I learned is uh, we had this company come film us to be on TV. It's a TV show. It's called The American Dream. And they said that KFC opens a new store every eight hours. So I started wow. thinking my business like that. Yeah, I'm not going to be every eight hours, but what would it look like? Where are the holes? What are the problems? Is it SEO? Well, then where? when do we need to start the SEO for a given city? Do we need to get the location three months in advance? How do we really make a name for a new city? How do we acquire businesses? There's all these things, but it, it's simply taking the time and working backwards gets you to the answer, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah, totally. First of all, you are like 10 levels deeper into this process and procedure stuff than I am. Like that stuff, I am I can only dream of being able to address those problems. Like we are in the basic stages of really, really building the playbooks, building the procedure, and creating those living documents that instead of having all this chaos and, and building them from scratch, we can simply go in if something's not working and tweak it and, and still have that document be, be rocking and rolling. I think the key to that is to make your, everything you do make it modular. Meaning that if you go on a user interface of your CRM, make sure that you can swap that out in case they change it yeah. without having, oh great, we gotta redo the entire manual, where do we yeah. start? So that's the beginning of it. And I think that actually dedicating time to the most boring, for me and you, oh, it's yeah. the most minuscule boring tasks of all time. It's monotonous and I hate it. But at the same time, I'm like, man, I got that same question. Or we've gotten a few car accidents, which I hate, but there's a procedure. You gotta go to a drug test mm -hmm. right after that. You gotta go to the nearest, um, there's all these drug test facilities in every single state. And then you got to get the driver's license or the other. But there's all these things. But we have forms within Service Ten, which is our CRM. Yep. And as you start to make more mistakes and get bigger, the answers kind of come in. You just need to document them and make sure people understand them. Absolutely. There's yeah. so much truth to that. Yeah. It's, it, this is this is where Sean hit the nail on the head of. He wants an expected result. He wants to be able to get get this thing done when he's not home and he's busy being daddy. And if he's gonna get that. He needs to make sure everybody kind of knows the rules of the game because how are they supposed to play or win the game if they don't know the rules? Absolutely. Yeah. That's what you're doing. You're, you're prepping your people to succeed, right? If it happens 80%, of the, maybe even 90% of the time, I want it in an operating manual. If it's a one-off, okay. If it's only 10% one-off, we can address that on the fly. But if it's happening 90% of the time, let's standardize it. Let's have, a, a, let's have that playbook for our people to go win. 
I love that. Yeah, and that, you know, people come into a new job and they go, you hand them a manual and they're like, what the hell is a manual? But you go, look, if we were about to play a new game, whether it's Candyland, Monopoly, or Uno, you would at least want to know how to play when you play and you know how you win and you know when you lost the game and you know when you're being observed and, and when the bank gives you a free go, you can collect $200, whatever that looks like. Yeah. Their directions. And so many times, can you imagine... I guess if we were going to play this game all day, every day, when you asked me the same question over and over, I'd be like, dude, you need to look it up right there in the directions. So you give people back their manuals, their SOPs, whatever you want to call that. Yeah. So I tend to really set big goals, but the way I've learned to set my goals is not to pick an arbitrary number. I pick where I want to be, which I think is doable, and work backwards. Tell me about one year, three year, and five years for, for energy. Yeah, so... Assuming we can conquer these playbooks and marketing plans uh, in the course of time that we want to, um, we did about seven million in sales last year. We will be we will be well over ten this year. We're hoping to be at fifteen next year, but in five years, um, our big goal and we haven't set a number to this, but we'd like to be a household name in, in home energy. There's very few companies that there's there's a lot of solar companies and a lot of insulation companies and a lot of HVAC companies. But there's very few companies that are able to handle all of those different products and solutions and offer them to one homeowner. So when we look at our business, that's who we want to be. We want to pioneer the home performance industry to encompass all of these different things and be able to really take a holistic approach to how we conquer people, people's high bills and uncomfortable spots in their home and indoor air quality and all of those kind of things. And that's what we're trying to achieve. And when we can achieve that, Man, it's going to be something special because we look around the country and we don't see anybody that's been able to do it. And it's tough. That many products is tough to standardize, right? But oh yeah, we're figuring it out. That's what we're doing. Well, it's you know progress, not perfection. Continuing, you'll never be perfect. The the two hundred or three hundred or four hundred million dollar companies. I've been to these companies. Yeah, they still have problems. Totally. <laughs> yes. As have I. And it's actually it's actually, you know relieving to go to those companies and know that even at our stage with all the problems, everybody's got problems. Oh, no, yeah. no company out there is perfect. And you know that was actually a good lesson for me to learn because I always thought these problems are exclusive to us. No, every entrepreneur, every company has their own set of issues. And a lot are the same issues that you and I experience at, at our given levels of business. That, yeah, and it is true that, that there are bigger problems when you get bigger, but there's less of them. They're not as... They're, they're more like crucial key decision problems like, okay, should we open or close this market? It's, you know, bigger totally. things like that. Bigger problems. <laughs> so back here, we are very, very light on Mondays. We usually run a Tuesday through Saturday shift. Um, but this is where we make outbound calls. So these guys are calling warm, cold, medium type leads. We've got Trent here. Say hello, Trent. Hello, hello. Trent is in our scheduling and retention and confirmation department. So he's the one having a lot of those conversations, making sure that homeowners are present and our reps are in a really good position to help out those homeowners. So back here, we've got um, one of our scoreboards. So this is- I love work. that you keep in track. Look at this. This is so powerful. The fact that these guys know they've got goals, they've got numbers they need to hit to be successful. And like I say all the time, if you don't know how to win the game, you can't win. Absolutely. So you don't need to go through necessarily what your numbers are, but tell me what your experience has been with kind of keeping score and what this has done to elevate the game of your business. Yeah, so it, it tells people where they're at, right? There's a scoreboard. Everybody sitting in this on, on our call team can look to the board and know exactly where they're at. They can know where everybody else is, and it, it drives this level of competitiveness, and, and it really goes to support the department. Like, it makes everybody better. Everybody. I love it. Especially my boy Trent. That's right. That's so over here, we've got our training room, right? So I don't exactly know how this saying goes, but most people spend, you know, 95% of the time in the game and they spend 5% training or, or mastering their craft, right? So it's really important to us in this space to have a, a, a turf, a room, a space where people can just constantly improve, right? So the whole thought is to swing to the opposite direction and spend more time improving, more time training, and, and not less time in the game, but be more prepared for the game. So we haven't hung our scoreboards or any of our culture stuff in here yet, but this room, it, I'll show it to you in a month, it will be decked out. 
but we do a lot of our direct to home, our, our direct guys do trainings in here. Um, our auditors are gonna start doing trainings in here. Every Thursday, we do a company all hands meeting with those of us in the office to kind of get on the same page and do a little rah-rah, we do those in here as well. So this room has served us very, very well. Um, I think a lot of companies skip the step of doing a nice training room and that's a big mistake. Big mistake. So you said something that really just popped out at me and it's household name and I'm torn because part of me says as I expand to become a household name means a lot of there's online and there's offline. Offline to me is TV, radio, or billboards. Yep. That's the branding. And then it'll wrap vehicles. Online is your social media. It's your programmatic TV, like Netflix type stuff, which is nice because you could really isolate your avatar. But you could spend a fortune building that household name, or you could just be the best at direct marketing and really getting that phone to ring when they're looking for your services and slowly let that household name manifest. What is your theory on that? Yeah, so I I like your strategy, right? Like it, it companies go broke oftentimes, not most of the time, but a lot of the time when they're investing everything in radio, TV, all of the really, really expensive media outlets. Like we don't take that approach. We don't do radio, we don't do TV. We canvas, we call, we go out and seek business, right? But you look at companies like, like yeah. Tesla, Probably a bad, bad example, okay? <laughs> Tesla. But Tesla, they don't do radio. They oh, don't yeah. do TV. They brand properly, and they are the household name for electric vehicles, right? So that's an ex extremely large company with a lot of financial backing, but it can be done, especially on, on, the, on the individual market basis, right? If we're looking at Phoenix, whether you want to say so or not, A1 is, is as close to a household name as you'll get. Mm. So kudos to you. We'll see. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, you kind of started talking a little bit about that you go get the business outbound. Now, you've used how many dialers? And pr talk to me a little bit about how a predictive dialer works and how you set up your call center. Because that's yeah, just one piece of it. Totally. So, as far as our call team goes, like, we're, we're an energy company. So, we work with local utility programs. We work with a lot of other local programs. So, it's easy for us to pick up the phone and call a stranger they've never heard of us, they've never seen us, and talk to them about enrolling them in these local programs. So we use a predictive dialer, and, and what that is is you know we, we zero in on our, our demographic and the data that we're trying to um, target. We purchase that data, and we turn it over to our call team. And what this predictive dialer does is when we've got every seat in that call center filled, it's automatically dialing new numbers for us. And it basically rings to one of our, our call center reps when somebody's on the other line. And these guys just continually introduce people to the programs and the, the services that we offer. And it's gotten to the point where, you know, if we have open slots for tomorrow, our call center is going to fill them with homeowners who did not know who we were at, at the morning we called. That's crazy. It just seems like, you know, it's a lot of work to make that happen, but I know what a lot of people think is exactly what I think is, man, I would never take that phone call. And so how often have I heard the phone ring and I'm like, ah, no, not interested. But I've heard the same people say Valpac doesn't work. I've had the same people say, oh, Google, I tried paying, it's too expensive. So one man's treasure is, or one man's garbage is another man's treasure, yeah. they say. And tell me, how many no's does it take to get a yes for some of your top performers? Let's say the top 10%. The, and you've been doing this for a long time. So yeah. what does what the top producer's close rate look like with something like that? So it varies rep to rep, but 9 out of 10 are going to say no. 90% of people are, are going to hang up the phone or say something mean or whatever. Get a that's, job. Get a real job. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how it goes. But you know, you kind of mentioned something that, that makes the most sense, and I know your business is this way too. You can't have one marketing outlet. You've got to have several channels that kind of work unison. So what I've seen, and the reason why we have a, a call floor and why we have you know guys out there canvassing and knocking on doors and we work home shows and events, a lot of people have given up on traditional old school marketing outlets. And I can 100% tell you with confidence, those marketing outlets are not dead. What a lot of people will say no to, maybe they'll never answer their door and sign up with somebody on their doorstep, or maybe somebody would never you know, sign, sign up with somebody on the phone, but there's plenty of people who will. 
And it's amazing because a lot of the people that will respond to those forms of marketing, you know, they won't find you through SEO or PPC right, or right. on Instagram. It's just a, it's a different clientele that just responds differently to marketing. So you said another source that I know you've been really starting to up your game is the canvassing door knocking teams. Yep. Um, I know they use a lot of Latter Day Saints. You know they they bring. Uh, uh, here's what I know: is cable alarms, uh, windows, and solar probably are the big four. Uh, is there any other ones that I'm missing? Pest control. Pest control. Um, yeah. Home remodeling in general. There's even financial service companies that that knock on doors. And the reason these companies do it is because it's extremely, extremely successful. Mm -hmm. So when you're canvassing or knocking on somebody's door, you're running into this person that, you know, like we do solar, we do a, a exterior product, you do garage doors, right? Something that's seen from the, the curb, as we would say. And you're reaching these people that have seen solar, that might have an opinion about solar, might even be interested in solar, but nobody's given them that extra little push to learn more about it. So you're, you're running into, in my mind, a person at the best place to, to meet them, their own front door, right? The other perk of, of canvassing and direct marketing like that is you've got their undivided attention. They're, they're, most people are gonna hear you out. They're gonna talk to you. They're not gonna scroll past you on Instagram or bypass your ad on Google. You're standing face-to-face -face conversing with this person and that's where people that are talented in the direct-to-home industry really, really thrive. I mean, there's several uh, hundreds, if not thousands of multi-millionaires that sell things door to door. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard of people making two, 300 grand in a summer. Oh yeah. It's Absolutely. not uncommon and that that's crazy to me. But you know, one thing I've noticed is it's a real tight, tight, they come in and they get, first you get out of your hometown. You get, you, you're, you're yeah. sent out somewhere typically. And then the next thing, what I found is they put them through this morning meeting of success and failure of you've got turned down, how to get over objections, how to really pull them in. I go, hey, the government's going to pay for this. You know, those keywords, those things to stay away from. And I've seen it done. It's, it's, some people consider that difficult, but some people consider a website difficult. Yeah, you know? absolutely. It's, it's just it's, in the eye of the beholder, really. Totally. Now, it is extremely difficult to build a, a, a really strong, direct team, right? It's a hard job. It's easy. Anybody can go do this, but it's hard. It's hard to have that self-discipline to get out there and continually meet homeowners. And, um, you know, my business partner, Tyler Nay, is, he's a master at this stuff. So, like, another value that he brought, which I, I don't have all that direct-to-home experience. He does, and he is, he's a... He's, he would dispute this, but he is the most talented person in that industry that I know. So bringing that value here has really, really, you know, thrown passion towards people that might not otherwise be good at canvassing or knocking on a door. And, you know, the, I think the biggest strength is to find somebody that actually mastered, you know, I'm working on the, uh, the event coordinator and I'm trying to figure out things that hasn't been done in my industry because I know they work. Oh yeah. But I know I know one thing. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I don't want to just take a stab at it and end up doing a hundred events in a month or two months or whatever. Yep. And say, man, I picked all the wrong events. It was the wrong demographic, the wrong avatar, not advertising the right thing. Didn't hire the people right. Didn't compensate them in the right program. All these things that have already been done. Yeah. So it's rarely the wrong event. If there's homeowners there. Yeah. Homeowners. I mean, how many homes in Arizona have a garage? Right. Well, no, I yeah, mine's easy unless we're going to like a bubblicious skating rink. <laughs> well, if you're running into a lot of renters or people that don't own a home, then it could it could be that event and the demographic there. Um, but if you're going to a, a solid event with enough people that own homes, it's typically going to be the person, the training. It's typically not the event itself. Okay. Uh, this is pretty cool, Sean. Uh, explain, <laughs> explain to me what. The, obviously, you got meetings going on everywhere. You got a meeting in your partner's office. Yeah. You got a meeting in here. Tell me about this. Yeah. So we, uh, it's a little shameful. We don't have as many likes on Instagram as we'd like, but this is a cool counter. Like we bring in people for interviews all the time, and they're kind of hanging in the lobby before we get with them. So if they like us on Instagram, or follow us on Facebook, or like us on Facebook, I'm sorry, follow here, like here, it real time flips. So the next person, it'll automatically, the second they do it, move to 3.30. Yeah. So that, it's S-M-I-I-R-L, Smurl. It's yeah, the coolest thing. I asked him right when I walked in. I was like, that's super cool. So this, this whole building set up to build the energy audit, 
solar air conditioning, anything to do with preserving energy. Correct, per, uh, uh, conserving energy and producing energy. So we're a full cycle energy company. Um, this is our home office. So we have a lot of guys out in the field, but this is where we kind of get things done. So this uh, is internally. cool. This is, is uh, I, I bet, spent a lot of time in this last building. He's actually right by the Christmas, I can throw a rock to the Christmas light business, but he won the Inc. 5000 two years in a row. Really excited, go, go stand there by that, be proud of him. Yeah, I'll show it. a little thumbs up here. Yeah. Yeah, so again, part of the part of the culture and, and things that we've accomplished, like our people are really proud of this, but you know, we won it in 2018. We were number 1215 and we won it again in 2019 at uh, 3182. And those are just things that we're proud of. We want to showcase. Okay, so Sean, I had some big issues with my data when it comes to financial reporting, whether that's QuickBooks or your CRM. I feel like I'm really good at handling problems when I know they exist, but sometimes ignorance is bliss for me. And now that I've actually had a really, really good person in charge of my finances and being able to trigger and hit, I mean, I see, I see my financials, a mountain's a big issue, a hill's a small issue, or vice versa if it's going, you know, like an iceberg. Yep. I'm able to fix these things as long as I get the right data and I get it on time. And I'll tell you what, I'm cruising right now at the best rate I've ever have. And I know you use a consultant for this, but what it, I've had it torn so bad that it was, it was so much to recover from a year and a half ago. Tell me a little bit about your perception on financials and how you use these indicators to run your business. Yeah, um, good question because finance is not my background and I don't think you went to school for finance either, right? No, no. So it's taken me a long time to get to this philosophy, but let the entrepreneur entrepreneur bring somebody in whether it be somebody that you take on internally and hire or a consultant like i use and and have them do their thing because i i cannot be trusted with the finances right like right. i don't know as much as a finance professional does i know enough to keep my business afloat and to keep keep doing what i do but like i we're not to a stage where we could bring you know a big dog in to to run our to be our cfo or to to have that overview of the finances but having a consultant does a couple things for me i get reporting delivered every wednesday every time i meet with my consultant i get accuracy like he's always cleaning up the books and making sure that if you know we needed to secure a line of credit or get an equipment loan he's got our books dialed into where that week we could just hand him over and i know most businesses don't have a clean set of books whether they at least at my stage whether they think they do or don't typically they don't so that's all been awesome by using a, a third-party consultant. We use B2B CFOs and we absolutely love our CFO. Um, but the other thing that they do is, you know, when I'm getting a little too outside the lines and getting a little crazy, they get to slap me in the face and say, Sean, stop spending all your money. Like, we're gonna set this aside. We're gonna be smart with it. We'll use it for scalability or whatever. But don't just go chase all these shiny objects that, that you think will work. Be smart with your money, and that's that's been huge for us. Yeah, it's nice to get you back on the solid road and narrow focus. I think for me, I was always off. I'll have more revenue coming in than you've ever imagined. Sales and marketing, baby. And then I realized, oh my gosh, this last six months has been. I've been. Oh man, I've done internal audits, and I mean, I I'm like, when's the last time we've used Mailchimp? Well, now we're using Service Tiny. Six months. I'm looking at all these things and they're bill after bill after bill after bill. Cut, 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 cut. And you can't cut your way to profit. Right. But you could cut out the bullshit. You could yeah. you could get rid of the, uh, the the extra layer of skin that's just eating away at the business. And I had a lot of things. I, I got to tell you, I couldn't believe certain markets weren't producing. Cut them. I mean, last year, last month, last month, I'm pretty excited because last month alone we paid off half a million dollars worth of bills that I wanted to get rid of. Just last month. Amazing. And that's just from cutting. And bef like I said, I, I hate to say cut your weight, but I'm so good at bringing revenue. We also had our best revenue month last year, or yeah. last month. So what are your thought th thoughts on that? Because I feel like most people are missing the revenue. Yeah. And I've been really good at that. But a lot of people, they just let all these extra things. And they uh, we had closed buildings in Dallas. And we were still paying for all these utilities and everything. It's like, who's we need to keep an eye on that stuff. So, um, yeah, and I think most business owners kind of fall into this trap, myself included. 
at the end of the day, it's easier to spend money than it is to make money for, for I think that's probably just a fact, right? So you've dialed in the revenue portion and you're not gonna cut your way to, to profits, but you are at the same time. Like every year, actually we're doing it once a quarter now, we're going through all of our subscriptions. All of the things that we may have said, yeah, let's sign on on a monthly basis for this service, and then we never end up using it. Or we use it and it falls off. Like that happens to us all the time. So it's, um, my CFO taught me this, but it's zero-based budgeting. When you look through all of the things you're spending money on, you better be able to justify it, and it better be working for you. And if it's not, cut it. Just immediately cut it, and you'd be amazed at the amount of, uh, extra the, money. The, the amount of extra money that if you continue to, to kind of run lean, as far as your finances go, the amount of money you'll have in the bank at the end of X, right? Well, there's a book called Profit First, and he talks about the uh, Parkinson's law. If it's in the bank, we tend to spend it. And it's kind of, it's kind of how our, our, some of our employees use their paychecks. Some yeah. of my guys make $4,000 a week. Yeah. And they have to borrow money for a $200 tool. And that's because they go to uh, the best steakhouse when they got the money in the bank versus if they don't, they tend to spend more conservatively yep. and go out and buy a nice steak, which you could do for $30, buy a couple nice steaks and a good meal. Absolutely. It's amazing. When people have something, they tend to use it. it everything. It, it's just from, like the space in a warehouse, everything. Totally. It's from the business owner all the way down to the sales rep that makes a bunch of money but spends every penny he has, right? It doesn't need to be that way, but that's where you create those accountability like for, for our people every now and then we'll bring in somebody that's great at saving and finance, a professional in that industry, and have them come educate our people because it's amazing what setting a little chunk aside will do in the long term for everybody. Business owner to, you know, employee. It, it is, it is, and they say, this is in a book, uh, this is not my phrase, but they say revenue is for vanity and profit is for sanity. And as you start really looking at that bottom line of profit, what you start doing is understanding the reason that margin, whether it be 6%, 10%, 15%, 20%, that percentage is lower because of not making certain cuts. So if you're cutting things like, I'm not taking my employees out to eat anymore, that's probably the wrong things to cut because the morale goes a long way. Totally. But by cutting, and I'm not gonna cut my AC bill, the only way I'll cut it is, hey, it automatically turns off at night, something like that, but I'm not gonna like keep us a little bit warmer yeah. in the summer uncomfortable so there's there's things it, it just goes back and I think it's so powerful I want to jump to this next step which I think probably is the number one question I get it through the podcast questions people hit me up on Facebook is is uh, really the secret to hiring yeah and I don't think anybody's for sure there are people that got it figured out but usually these companies <laughs> are smaller uh, obviously Walmart there, there's some huge companies too but what have you learned in the last few years about hiring? And, and you look, you've you've actually told me that you've had some good guys, but they couldn't pass a background or drug or whatever it is. Yeah, and it's hard. It's it's a hard. It's it's hard when the unemployment rate's so low. It's super hard. Like a good economy is great for homeowners spending money and investing in their homes, but it it's equally as difficult on bringing in talent, right? So yeah. they say most of the the married people are are well. Most of the good people are married, right? They're in another job or they're working for another company. So it's not I, always the case. It's not always the case, but <laughs> I, I've learned. I've been married. <laughs> I've learned so much on the hiring and recruiting and all that kind of, of, of process over the last two years. I, I don't even know where to begin. I will start with this. We are not professional recruiters. So we outsource that. And that has grown our business leaps and bounds. There's certain things that we always want to control and keep in-house, but then there's certain things that we're not a recruiting company, and, and we'll admit it. And we're not to the point, again, where we can hire an outside recruiter to exclusively work for us. So that's been huge. Um, a couple other things that have been you know, big for us at 4 Energy is we need to hire just in case and not hire just in time. And what I mean by that is if we're hiring just in case, that is constantly recruiting. That's having... a a new resume in your inbox every single day. Uh, recruiting just in time is when a key person at your organization is like, see ya, they don't give their two weeks notice, they're just out of here, right, for, for whatever reason. And that puts organizations in a stressful situation. Now somebody else, and usually multiple people around the office, have to pitch in and do that person's job. 
and they're not going to do it as well as the individual did. So we are getting to the habit of constantly posting, especially our volume positions like technician, energy auditor, sales rep, call marketer. We want new fresh resumes in our inbox every single day, whether we're hiring or not, because we know the pain that we're going to feel when, when somebody just leaves in a crucial position. Now the second thing, and we haven't even, um, we haven't even taken this on yet, but we're gonna start using predictive indexing. So this is similar to DISC, similar to a, a personal profile, and what this is gonna do is it's going to allow us to build that rock star profile um, centered around who we're looking for for a position, and then when we take on all these, all these candidates, we can make sure that they actually fit the personality and profile that will succeed in that position. So that we're expecting to be huge for us. So tell me a little bit more because you got me curious. I know, so a DISC assessment, there's Myers-Briggs, there's, uh, I, I've used probably a dozen of them in my psychology college years. Yep. And it turns out I'm born to be very successful. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> would not be surprised. <laughs> okay. I can tell you there's a lot of defaults in there. That's like uh, some of the things you want to hear and you're like, well, I'll take this from that personality. Yep. But uh, my question is, Predictive indexing. Tell me exactly. I understand. So it's building your avatar of what they look like. Yeah. Is that what it's doing? So yeah. certain qualities will make a better accountant or a better salesman or door to door or whatever. Yeah. Is that what it is? Totally. But it, it's 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 really interesting to know. Like you take like I took this test, and it was two pages. Like DISC took me through all these all these. They asked the same question ten times in a different wording, and sure. it, that was confusing. I didn't like that. Okay. Felt like standardized testing in school. Predictive indexing was two pages. I think the first one was, how do you feel others perceive you? And I could be a little wrong on this. And the second one is, how do you perceive yourself? And it's just check boxes of different qualities, right? Well, you select all these check boxes, hit the next page, select all these check boxes, and then it spits out a profile. And when I read my own profile, I was like, dang, how does predictive indexing know me better than me? But the cool thing is, like people are who they are, right? Like you can constantly try to force change in people, but there's certain qualities that they're never gonna shed. And at least understanding these people and, and their strengths, their weaknesses, how to manage. Back in the belly. So we've got, come check this out. So this is our break room. And one of the things that Tommy had mentioned is a lean, a lean chore board or the lean companies do their own cleaning, right? And that does a couple things. It makes people proud of where they work. It makes them protective of where they work and it makes them care about the integrity and cleanliness of their office. So here we've got, this is the belly. We've got our warehouse, all of the offices I just took you to. And we, on a weekly basis, we're implementing this as we speak going to be rolling in responsibilities for everybody in this office. Like I'm the CEO of the company. There will be times where I'm assigned a bathroom. I will be cleaning the bathroom for four energy. And I'm totally willing to do that because this is a place where like I use the bathroom here. I use the break room in here. I need to find some responsibility and some want to take part in keeping it cleanly. So this is really, really awesome. We, uh, we learned this from two second lean and ER2. Very cool. Well done. That's emojis. I love that. I'm having you print a new one, uh, like ASAP, and I need it to be on a magnetic board. Okay. Nothing uh, glamorous here, but we've got a men's and a women's room. Okay, so my question for you to follow up on that is, so it's it's simply a personality test in substitute of one of these other ones. Almost. Correct. Yeah, okay. it's totally, and they're all great. They're all, I, I really enjoy the results of my disc. I just wasn't a fan of the process to get those results. PI for us, super easy, super quick. And what does it go for? As far as cost? Yeah. Um, there's a yearly subscription and then I believe you're paying per profile, but it's it's minimal, it's like a background check. Something that you're gonna already spend. It's like a couple grand for the license and 20 bucks a pop or something? Let's say, yeah. Okay. I don't remember off the top of my, top of my head, but um, you know, we're not in a market where everybody's heard hire slow, fire fast. At my given stage in business, I can't afford to do that. Like when we try to hire slow and take people in for multiple steps, multiple interviews, you know, we call them back for the second visit and it's like, hey, I took a job. Everybody's hiring. So the kind of thing that you can inject to assist with hiring quickly 
is these type of profiling. Yeah, I think that uh, I made a list of kind of what I expect because my goal as a marketer is to come up with 50 great applicants per day. Yeah. Somebody might say, how the hell is that possible? Well, it's not going to happen from inbound hitting ZipRecruiter, Craigslist, uh, Indeed, and I could go on and on Career Builder. It's going to happen from going to honey holes and understanding where they are, whether that's Facebook groups, whether that's high school coaches, whether that's recruiters for high school sports, whether that's youth ministries, whether that's your customer base you're already hitting, whether that's, there's so many places. And what I want to see is I want people in my office arguing on who they think is going to be the best. I want 10 of them being like, no, 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 but this. I don't want them going, we don't have anybody. The last guy had knuckle tattoos, which isn't a bad thing, but our customers don't seem to appreciate that. Totally. Uh, so that's the goal, and I, I think there's a lot of insight there, and I, I'm absolutely a big fan of understanding their social. I go on their social media. I check their Facebook to see if they're positive or negative. Yeah. I ask them to tell me a joke. To, and the biggest thing for me is do they smile on what I want to invite them to a barbecue? Yeah. That's, that's very telling. But um, for us, after going through you know, the interview, the, the PI, at the end of the day, does that person fit your culture? Right. right. Like oh, one, yeah. of, one of our values is, is positivity. And that's super important because somebody that's negative all the time, like you mentioned, looking them up on social media, if they're just throwing out posts like F this, F that, one star review on Yelp, like, just super negative, you better bet that that's going to translate into your organization and negatively impact people around them. So that's ultra, ultra important to make sure that somebody really aligns with your company values. And you better make sure that your company values are, are your actual values and you're living them as a company and they're not just posted on a wall somewhere. So that's a big part of recruiting and, and bringing in the right people. I just was thinking I need to be a little less political online, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk, I got about four more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, I think one of the biggest things in my business was really understanding a chain of command, which is an org chart, but also there's nobody that shares in the results of that position. It's not like, well, you could do a little bit, Giuseppe could do a little bit, we'll have Gianni and Adam part of it, and all of you guys kind of take care of it on your day. There's 100% somebody that gets the praise or, or, the, the carrot or the stick in this case for every position. You've got the responsibility. You have all the accountability on you. And I think by giving 100% of accountability, saying the buck stops at you, yeah. and if we win, you're going to get congratulated and you will make more money than you ever have. And more importantly, we'll go out to lunch, we'll talk about your success, everything will be great. But if you lose, you understand, I will not take the credit for when you win. Yep. But I won't take the credit for when you lose either. Right. So tell me a little bit about how important that is and kind of, because I think as a small business, we tend to say, we'll all do a little bit, we'll piece it together, and this person yeah. could be this, 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 and this, and that's a horrible mistake. Horrible mistake. So, yeah, and I, I've got to preface this with, I'm very conscious of this, we're not the best at it. Our organization is still at the stage where, again, if some a key player leaves, a lot of people start chipping in to, to do that job, right? Someone has to, I understand that. Right, but very few people can be the master and, and win at a lot of different things, right? So having somebody have a job, know what, what it is that makes them win and what it makes them to lose is extremely important. And the second you start giving that particular person multiple responsibilities, you're gonna see mediocrity even in the things that they should or are great at. You give them too much and they can't focus, they can't master the one thing and be the best at that. Personally, I just see people be meh at a lot of different things. So getting to that stage in business where we can have somebody own every little aspect and every position within our company, that's extremely important and mm -hmm. I every day see the successes and failures and ultimately they're my failures, right? Because mm -hmm. I might task our person who runs our shows and events to do something else that they're not super good at. Well, what does that do? That makes them okay at something and it takes away from their ability to rock at home shows and events. The, the, I, I'm, I'm guilty of it. My, a lot of my management has been guilty of just, they overtask somebody with too many things, they over delegate and then all of a sudden they're like, what, well, you left me, there, there was no place for me to go but fail. Yeah. And now it's like, look, here's your responsibilities. Are you up for this? And I, you ever hear you can't teach an old dog new tricks, uh -huh. that expression? Well, 
they came in, they signed up for your business today. Now that was three years ago. Now all of a sudden there's new expectations. Now all of a sudden you have a new dress code. Now this, this, this. Sometimes they look at that and they go, well, this is not what I signed up for. That's why I love expectations and I love, we use a thing called Paylocity and you update the handbook and they've got to sign it every month or even every week yep. if you could be that good because here's the thing. If you know transitionally, oh, they added this, they added this, they added this, it's consistency. Yep. It's adding a little bit, it's a little, I gotta take this. But now all of a sudden, you just switched everything. And that's where I think the biggest mistake of entrepreneurs fail is when they go, oh, I got a consultant, things are gonna change, everything's brand new. Yeah. You're gonna change this, you're gonna change this. I personally like the old dogs, and sometimes they can't roll because some of the people that'll take you here are the people that'll take you here. What got us here won't get us there. I mean, that's that's true in a lot of cases. In other cases, you know, those people can continue they to, can grow, to, yeah. to grow. Some, but yeah, you know, you're right. Um, most people don't like change. No. Nope. And they don't like a lot of change coming at them all at once. Like a lot of people, that's upsetting to them. Like even the fact that. You know, you were at our old office, you visited. It was like shorter ceilings, little compartments, crazy colors, things were dirty. Pac Man. It was, we had a Pac Man machine, we did. <laughs> but it was, it was gross, in my opinion. And even though we were moving into this nice new office that's, you know, two and a half times the size of our old one, it was upsetting to some of our people. And that was kind of amazing to see. And it was because we were throwing a lot of change at them over the course of a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Right? So I love your idea of, of consistency, little chunks, not this big, hey, we just did an overhaul of our, our handbook. Go ahead and sign it. Right. That's not what I signed up for. That's a lot to chew. But if you're taking small little nibbles and it's like, oh, well, we've got to wear closed toe shoes in the warehouse. That's easy. I'll go get a pair of shoes, right? And then you, you feed these little changes over a longer period of time. That's a amazing strategy. And I think you'll have a lot more people buy into that than, hey, everything is. is. Well, it's kind of like working out, you know, if you say, look, I'm going to have the best body ever. Or if you say, you know what, I'm going to focus on five pounds this month. I'm going to focus on really getting my abs under control and just a little bit. Yeah. It's consistency. Uh, I think that's it's what I found. Um, okay, so um, this is our uh, one of our beautiful trucks that Mellow Motive had wrapped. So. This is um, very important because, you know, when we're rolling through a neighborhood, we want people to know what company is parked outside the house. You see right here, this is a van that will be at Mellow Motive very, very soon to get wrapped. Like it's what, very... what happened? Uh, that's a great story. So yeah. Sean actually shared with me some footage of a police helicopter and the police <laughs> out to see this van. Go ahead and tell them the story. Yeah, so uh, this is a, a testimonial to Mellow Motive. And for those of you rolling unmarked white vans to your uh to your installs we we rolled up to this community and somebody thought our guys were there to like rob the community so they're there to do our work that we do every day and somebody called the police and a police car and a helicopter showed up so that van will be wrapped how soon can i get it in yeah, for the next two weeks look at how good he is he just made a deal but but you know the cool thing is how literally though i think this speaks testaments not only because it looks good, but you know, Rosie's on the house. For those of you that don't know, is a radio all-star that really, if you qualify for this, it's huge. He's got his energy symbol there. He's got his five-star Yelp and his A plus BBB. But it doesn't take away. If you guys look here, these are all pictures of a neighborhood, and a lot of them have solar on them. It's yep. it's pretty cool. It pops when you're driving, so it's it's just a cool thing that that lets them know who they are and. Really, he's got you a lot of exposure. Absolutely. Have you gotten, I don't know. Do we really... get calls off our truck. We get calls off our yard signs. I mean, it's yeah. really important when you're in the field to be repping who you are. It is. And it, the level of professionalism is important to the customers. Let's go back inside. So networking is a huge deal. I think networking is, one of the things I love about networking is even in a depressed economy, you make friends, you treat people right, you're gonna be able to make it through anything. Uh, when I replaced your garage door, I think I had about 25 people hit me up of your friends. You've got me more business. I think we're going to one of your guys' garage tomorrow. I mean, it, 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 so much business from you. What is the secret, and thank you by the way. I appreciate yeah, you're it, welcome, all of course. Of you know I'm right, you're my guy. Um, <laughs> And you're always looking for that opportunity. I think you've became, you know, there's Joe Polish who just puts people together. He gets them in a room. 
he's not really a jack of all trades, but he knows everybody how they could help, and you've become to do that. And when I read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People for the 20th time, I thought about you. It's just, you ask a lot of questions, and you're like, hey, I know a guy, I know a guy. You're always kind of, what's the secret to doing that, and how have you kind of just, was it the way you were raised? Did you watch your dad do it? What was what was that incubator moment or whatever that might have been to help you become that? Because it's a huge deal in business. Yeah, so um, this is something that I personally have, have just kind of found myself being good at. It's not something that I've, I've constantly focused on. I think it's one of my more natural skills, and it probably is because of my upbringing, because of my, my mom and dad, and, and how social they are, and how easily they can you know talk to people. Like growing up, my dad would make a, a corny joke to every waitress we've ever had, and I was always like, you know, shut up, dad. But it got me to that now point that where guy. it's like, yeah, now I get to be that guy. But it, it's got me to a point where, you know, how to win friends and influence people was super impactful to me. And I think before I read that book, I was already doing a lot of the, uh, you know, little principles that, that you learned from that book. But they're true. You do things like, like, I'll say this before I get into that book. I genuinely like knowing people. So I think that that's an impro- a crucial component to networking, right? Like if you're the guy that just goes to a little mixer and you're like, hey, you know, come, let's have coffee next week, Tommy. I'm sure you told me you live in a house. I want to tell you all about solar. That's not going to, that's not going to work. That's not the right approach to uh, earning business or earning a friend or a professional colleague. It's just not. But if you're out there genuinely meeting people and getting to know them and, and asking questions first and talking later, you're going to get people starting to ask about you. And the one thing I'm never shy about, like I'm in several organizations in town, is you know, I, I, I'll say, hey, my name's Sean. I own a company called Four Energy. We do X, Y, and Z. And I stop. That's it. I dive into something more personal about myself. But over time, I really develop the relationships with guys in these groups or girls in these groups. And guess what happens when somebody, you know, a buddy of mine owns a, a roofing company. And um, if he ever finds somebody that needs solar, it's, hey, I know a guy. It's Sean. Yeah. He knows solar. So between genuinely getting to know people and wanting to know people and not just for my own personal benefit but to gain a friend or somebody I can work with in the future or somebody I can connect to somebody else that's awesome that stuff goes and it's it's transparent to other people when you're genuine so the third part about that is I do love connecting people like if I have a friend that like I have that buddy he's a veteran he hit me up last week and he's like hey I'm the spring (laughs) <laughs> hey, I need springs, and I know you know Tommy from A1 Garage Doors. Can you hit him up? So I shoot you a text earlier today, and you guys are going out there tomorrow. Like, that's how it works. I'm not in this to try to sell every one of my friends and family and every one of their connections the services that I offer. But if I can connect and give more in value than I'm taking in payment, it's going to come back to me. And, and, yeah, absolutely. Great, yeah. It's also principles in, in the book The Go-Giver. Like, th- that's a core book to who we are. Amazing book. Amazing book. But if you live by those, your networking will just come to you. You don't have to be a great speaker. You don't have to be, everybody's a little uncomfortable in a situation where you're meeting new people. But if you show genuine interest, it comes back. It just does. That's, it's, that's probably the most important thing out of this interview is just understanding that being open. And when you're networking, someone was asking me, like, how quick do you get into the cell? I'm like, I don't the first time. I do a needs yeah. analysis and I just say, hey, how can I help you? And the people who have sold me and done a great job of it never come in wanting anything from me. They say, how can I help? Yeah. What are you working on? Is this even the time of your life or your business for us to offer our services? Because the best thing one guy did is said, dude, he comes in. Uh, Brian with the radio ads and he said, dude, I'm going to put your account on hold. He goes, you're not answering the calls because I listen to every single one of your calls. You're just not answering it quick enough. Listen to this CSR. I'd work with her a little bit more. This guy's a stallion. I'd make him the trainer. You know, those are the kind of things. And when he gave me that insight, I was like, oh my God, this guy, he could have had a longer relationship, maybe three more months. And then I would have said, get, get, get out of here. You're done. But he made it work to what we're still using him for things. And I think that's Honesty is probably the most, and to be compassionate, and, and actually, he's just really good at eye contact and just telling me, look, this is what I would do. Yeah. And that means a lot. That goes a long way with people. Totally. That builds trust, and that strengthened your relationship, most likely. Oh, right. it did. Yeah. All right, this is the last topic I want to talk about. So you introduced us to a guy, 
was it is it Chris over at ER2? Yeah. Chris at ER2. I always want to say Matt. So Chris is just he's the epitome of lean and the way ER2 is this facility that refurbishes computer parts and accessories. They sell some of them on eBay. They've got all kinds of places they sell them on Good Egg, uh, Craigslist, different offer up. And a lot of it, they'll take all of Intel stuff, they'll crush the hard drives, they'll give them all new equipment, they'll take the old stuff, refurbish it, sell it, they do an amazing job. It's the most neatly well-kept, I mean, it's it's a model of what lean is. And we, we've heard of the, the book, uh, Two Second Lean by... Paul Akers. Paul Akers, and I had him on my podcast. But Sean introduced me to them, and I've been there three times now for a, a walkthrough. And yep. uh, tell me what, you know, we're not the perfect lip. Look, it took him years to get to where he's at, but we've made a lot of progress. Tell me what that's done to your business and what, what is lean, first of all? So efficiency. It, it, it is. Lean is efficiency, right? Like if there's a better, faster, cheaper, easier way to produce the same result, why would we not do that? So when, um, and I, I believe my first time touring ER2 was also with you. I yeah. think we did that yeah, together. Yeah, we were together. Yeah. Like, it's jaw dropping, like jaw on the floor. That's how dialed in this guy's company is. And the whole concept behind Lean is what I just said. You, you, you implant this, this culture into your company that, that gets your employees really buying into the fact, if there's a better way to do my job, I have the opportunity to put my thumbprint on that and change it across the company. Right, so like you go to ER two and you get this this awesome tour of like everybody doing their job and and Chris the CEO could point to any one of his people at any time and say hey what's your lean improvement and like right there in front of 20, 30 people that are getting this tour they're like excited to to say hey well instead of doing this I made it to do this and I trimmed five seconds off of our production time per item well to a lot of people five seconds is nothing right. But if you add up five seconds over the course of a, a work day, it turns into minutes, right? Then you do that over the course of a week, and then over the course of a month, and then a cor- over the course of a year, and the result is amazing. And they are focused on trimming seconds off of every little piece within their organization. And it's, it's fascinating. Well, you know, with that, with that exact analogy of they've got their upstairs and they've got a slide to go downstairs. And he put a slide in just for the more of the definition of what lean is. Now, if I think about it, let's say we have, I don't know, 100 people using that. Let's say it saves a minute. One minute, 100 people a day by going down the slide and having a little bit of fun and putting a smile on your face. That's an hour and 40 minutes of productivity yeah. is 100 minutes, right? So you just added an hour and 40 minutes a day. Yep. Now, that's one. That's just putting a slide in. Yeah. Now, you start to add up the five seconds, the 10 seconds, the one minute. All of a sudden, you're recovering three hours, then five hours, then 10 hours, to the point where they get things so dialed in that they've saved 20 jobs. Absolutely. Literally 20 people's jobs. 20 people at 40 hours a week because it's 800 hours. Yep. Boom, they've saved that. And that's where their profit comes in. That, that's a great way to control everything from payroll oh, yeah. to, to the, the quality controls, like Six Sigma of the... Because lean, we think about lean manufacturing, which is a, a equivalent to kind of Six Sigma manufacturing, is right. like within the certain standard deviation of being perfect. And I was just fascinated. I definitely recommend the two second lean as an introduction, and then the videos that go with that. Oh yeah. Oh man. I mean, they don't have a cleaning crew. Everybody's in charge of the cleaning there. I mean, yeah. everything. You guys got to check it out if you haven't heard about it. It's amazing. It's got a nice little hangout area. Yeah, very yeah. cool. And then uh, we got, this is where we just did some interviewing, but uh, yep. you've got a little area here. You got your whiteboards. Yep. You got another board here. You got your uniforms. We nice do. desk, very clean, simple. I love it. Simple, simple. We make our desks out of solar panels here too. So uh, this is a panel that would go up on somebody's roof. Uh, you know, it's now a table for us. Very and cool. it's awesome. Now I'm gonna introduce you to my business partner. He's in the middle of something, but we're gonna interrupt. So come All on right, back. Here you go. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt a uh, a training here, but uh. But you got a mouse in your hand too. Yeah, he's <laughs> a video camera and a mouse. That's his nickname, Field Mouse. Field Mouse. <laughs> So this is Tyler's office. Um, I spoke a lot about, uh, about Tyler um, on the interview just now, and uh, Tyler really, really owns the direct side of our business. So, say hello to Tyler. 
Hey. Any words of wisdom while we pop in the I don't office? Know. I, f I feel bad because I didn't get a chance to defend myself against what I was saying about myself. <laughs> Told you. We'll have to do a follow-up of defense. Uh, love you have to watch love this Tommy Mello. I'll just say that. Love Tommy Mello. <laughs> there you Perfect. go. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. All right. So, Sean, I want to go into kind of the, the way I wrap everything up, and those are three things. Number one is if someone wants to get a hold of you, if someone wants to, whether it's an email, chat on social, whatever that looks like, LinkedIn, what's the best way to contact you? Yeah, so you can uh, shoot me an email at Sean, S-E-A-N, at 4energy, F-O-R, energy.com. You can find me on Instagram at Sean K. McGraw. You can find me on LinkedIn, Sean McGraw. Um, shoot, I'll even give out my cell phone number because I am a connector. My cell number is 248-895-2662. I'm accessible in a lot of different ways. Give me a call if you have any questions on anything. You want solar on your house, you want an energy audit. Uh, shoot, you want a new friend? Give me a call. <laughs> hey, what's your Snapchat? No, I'm just kidding. Not on Snapchat uh, anymore. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so I always ask, we've talked about the Go-Giver, we've talked about when friends and influence people Give me three books that maybe, you know, we've all heard of Influence, we've all heard of, talked about a lot of books. You know me. We go yeah. back and forth. You've got Audible. You learn how to adjust the speeds. We're, we're big Thank Audibles. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, tell, me, tell me about a few books that you'd really recommend. It doesn't have to, you know, we always talk about this helped my business. It could be something that maybe helped your marriage or something that brought you closer spiritually to yourself or whatever that looks like. But maybe some different books that... that you know, we know the E myth. We know, you know totally. So I'm gonna give three. I'm gonna give three books, and two of them we have mentioned. Okay. In this podcast, but um, the first book is The Go Giver. I mean, this is a book that you can take the principles, the laws of the Go Giver, and apply to your friendships, your relationship, your your business. Just just genuinely how you how you treat people across the board. Um, the second one is Two Second Lean. Um, this is something again that you can apply to your business. You can apply to home. Although some of your your husbands or wives might might hate you for doing this, uh, but you can lean up your house for sure. Um, <laughs> and the third one, and this is uh, this is more so for business, is the four disciplines of execution. Um, this book, if if implemented properly, it just works, and it it gives people that scoreboard that allows them to know if they're winning or losing. It, it creates a cadence of accountability. It's, it's four disciplines that if you implement them in your business, your organization will be stronger across the board, period. You're gonna need that one. You're gonna need the four disciplines. Who's the author? You, the... Don't author me. All right, I won't author you. <laughs> um, last thing we do is, we talked about a lot. I think there's so many aspects of a business, but when I go back to the beginning of, of even looking at the, the Christmas life business, I. What I've realized now is motivating people, and I do that through compensation programs, recognition, disciplining one-on-one, -on -one, really in a public spot, t praising them. And there's so many little things. But take yourself back to really to those vital years. Not, not you know, I know there was years that I was around with my garage doors. Really, I wasn't, I wasn't in the business as I am now. Yeah. And I wasn't working on it or in it. I was doing other, I was bartending, doing other stuff, and you were going to school and doing other things. So let's talk about what the mindset really what what'll help you transform yourself into who you're becoming today. What are some of those thoughts? What do people need to work on? What's your last kind of I'll give you the floor to discuss anything that'll help somebody from that to get to that next level. I don't care how big you are. Yeah, for us at this given stage, take all the things I said and apply those, like building process and procedure. After that, it's it's be in the mindset of collecting and raising talent, collecting and raising leaders, right? If you've got that mindset and you're constantly taking on good people and plugging them into a system that works, the sky's the limit. And some of the best organizations ever, that's what they do. They, they, they take on and create leaders. And that's what I'd say. And that's what we're up to here at 4 Energy. And we're, we're always gonna be doing that. That's our mindset. And that's our plan for growth. If we can continue to take on awesome people and treat them and continue to be able to offer them more and make this a better place to work with culture and comp plans and all that kind of stuff, taking care of your people and bringing on good people, they will take care of our customers and generate more of them for us. So that's what I'll leave you with. I love it. And uh, I just want to add one thing to Sean's little notion there is I've had a guy working for me for three years. He's been number one every year. Yesterday he had his best day ever. And we, we took him. 
and I want you to better your best. I think that's the best way to say it is forget everybody else. I don't want you to compare yourself to you know David and Goliath, if you will. I don't want you to compare yourself to this guy. Just better your best. Yeah. Continue to strive for the best and aspire to be number one. Absolutely. Those are just the competitiveness. So great job, brother. Tommy, Appreciate you. thanks for having me. All right, so that is Four Energy. This is Sean McGraw. You got his phone number. You know where to find him. You do. Tommy, thanks for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it.